Hello and welcome to Spy Hard's podcast, the best spy movie podcast hosted by me, Agent Scott. Wait, am I included in this or is it just the best podcast hosted by you? It's just me. Oh, fair enough. I see what you're doing. You are taking a dynamic duo and splitting them, giving yourself all the credit for the story that is this week's episode. I understand completely and it all makes sense as we continue through uh, the movie we're going to cover this week. But I am Cam the Provocateur and Scott, French toast must be eaten while hot. I mean, that <laughs> is uh, that, that is good advice. I sound like I'm losing my mind. <laughs> it makes no sense. It must be eaten while hot. <laughs> you might be dealing with a uh, thrush infection there, Cam. Who knows? <laughs> Gotta go to the clinic. See you later, Scott. <laughs> you truly are operating this one solo. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, oh, good joke. Good joke. Thank you. Thank you. Well, before you get there, Cam, we need to induct our latest Spy Hard, Die Hard, uh, and uh, well, why don't you tell the people before you go, Cam, how does one become a Spy Hard Die Hard? Of course, you can become a Spy Hard's Die Hard by leaving a five-star review with Apple Podcasts and writing us a little review that we can read on the air. And then once we've read that review, we will give you your top secret Spy Hard's Die Hard nickname. Now, Cam did give away a hint there. It has to be able to be read on the show. We've had hundreds in the last week, but they're all full of swear words, so I can't say them. Oh, that's also true, yes. The laced with profanity emails, send those somewhere else. <laughs> oh, emails? You can keep sending them, but reviews, be careful. But there was one lovely five-star review that I'll highlight this week, and it comes on the UK Apple podcast from one Harley Mumford, and they write, Brilliant podcast, five stars. A wonderful podcast that explores a truly diverse subset of movies. Give it a listen, and you'll be sure to be entertained and enlightened. Oh, well, thank you very much, Harley. That's very kind of you. And your new Spy Hard's nickname is Solo. See, I wondered what you were going to do. I thought you might go with Vulcan. No, no, that can, like, sound too nerdy. Solo is badass. Well, Harley Mumford, you are now Agent Solo. Pretty good name to have. Yeah, what am I going to do with the other uh, <laughs> entries in this franchise we're going to tackle going forward? We'll find out. Uh, well, next week, next time will be Agent uh, Koyakin, I suppose. <laughs> I suppose so, yeah. <laughs> Somehow just not as, uh, as easy to roll off the tongue. But uh, yeah, make sure you become a spy hard, die hard, folks, and support the show by leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. But without further ado, let's get to the review. All right, folks, here we are. We are launching a new franchise, and we needed some very special help a commander you might say the spy commander making his third appearance on the show it is none other than mr bill koenig hello sir how are you i'm doing great uh, thanks for having me i know i lot i lobbied for this one the first of these but you know well, that's, and we'll get into the film itself. Maybe that is an important discussion to have up front because, you know, people have clicked play. They know what we're talking about. We haven't got to hide it so much. But, you know, well, maybe we'll get to why specifically this film of the uncles. But what is it about the, the Man from Uncle movies that made you sort of want to put your hand up and say, I want to talk about them? Well, uh, first of all, the Man from Uncle was how I got involved with the spy craze in the 60s. That is. Okay. That is that show, the TV version. That's how I got involved, and I ended up getting uh, becoming involved with James Bond through the Man from Uncle because in the in November of '65, um, the Man from Uncle was preempted on NBC to show this. TV special, The Incredible World of James Bond, and like, whoa, like this, this, I discovered James Bond through Uncle. Now, I may not be the typical case. Uh, a lot of people discovered Bond first, but I do find it interesting when uh, Bond fans dismiss Uncle and said, well, guys, if it weren't for Uncle, I might not have become a Bond fan, <laughs> but they don't want to hear that, so. Here it goes. Was it an easy transition into becoming a Bond fan, or did you initially have that kind of feeling of like, 
well, this isn't quite as good as Man from Uncle. Like, I am a Napoleon Solo guy versus a James Bond guy. No, it was more like, I mean, what happened was The Incredible World of James Bond aired in place of The Man from Uncle. The Man from Uncle was preempted in November of 65 to show that special. And so, like, that special opened my eyes. Like, whoa, here's, here's this whole other thing. And like, you know, it, and, and that special, um, it had this uh, voice, this character actor doing the voiceover uh, named Alexander Scorby. And he like lent this kind of, uh, he, he made it sound so serious and so perfect. And like, so when he said things like, he has a license to kill, like, whoa, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm like leaning back, like, whoa. And you know, The Incredible World of James Bond really was an infomercial, but it had this gravitas that, like, you know, for a le- seven-year-old me, like, like overwhelmed me, like, whoa. Um, so that's how I became a James Bond fan. One led to the other. Hmm. Was it more of a case of once you stumbled upon that James Bond special that you kind of, stopped playing with the uncle toy and you were more like hey james bond is the man now or did you find you were just part of that sort of synergistic 60s spy phenomena with i spy and get smart on the air and everything as well i was a creature of the spy craze yeah and and it was all it all just re everything reinforced the other um when i look back at it you know there were like some things that were more serious some things were more fantastic but it it was a fantastic it was a great time to be a spy fan i i and i try to get across to people like how fantastic it was but you know it's like i don't think because you also had the wild wild west and you had get smart and you had all this stuff and it was like it was great (laughs) just it was fantastic you know, I mentioned uh, your website, The Spy Command, also it's a podcast and it's also your sort of handle on social media. But one thing I sort of stumbled across in my research is uh, a, a website of yours titled The Man From U.N.C.L.E. Episode Guide. So uh, y- you've got a digital footprint when it comes to The Man From U.N.C.L.E. The Man From U.N.C.L.E. Episode Guide was my first foray into the internet. Because at the time, this was the mid to late 90s, and like, you started to see um, fan sites, mm-hmm. and I knew I wanted to do one. And um, in my case, the Man from Uncle, basically, I had copies of almost all the episodes. In some cases, they were TV episodes, in some cases, they were movies. Um, but, you know, Hawaii 5 was, was a show like I liked almost as much as The Man from Uncle, but mm. there were already man, uh, Hawaii 5 sites, but I couldn't find any Man from Uncle sites. So I said, that's what I'm going with. And so I, so that's how it went. And you're very active in the Bond community online. You know, you would be the person to ask, what is the sort of the sense of like, is there an active at all Man from Uncle community online at all nowadays or does it feel like something that's kind of faded a little bit to the background of the 60s spy craze there is but you kind of have to have to kind of uh hunt for it Mm. um there are a number of man from uncle uh pages on facebook i have one called the united network command for law enforcement but there are others and um yeah so it's still there it's not as you know at times, I, I, I feel like, am I like a druid? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so, but like I, I have some self-doubt about it. So, Well, I can say I was very interested because when we reviewed the Man From U.N.C.L.E. film, the 2015 film, early on in the podcast run, we watched the pilot uh, in conjunction with that review. Right. And I really, really enjoyed that pilot. Mm -hmm. and was interested in picking up the box set and working my way through the series. And it was out of print and unavailable. And if I wanted to get it, it was like very expensive. 
and I was buying from some unreliable sellers who were selling it used. However, at the time of recording this, it has popped up on Amazon. They are re-releasing it uh, basically in two weeks uh, from the time of recording this. So there must be enough demand that they felt compelled to put this box set out there again. I have pre-purchased mine, so mine will be on its way at the start of March. But it's interesting to me that I was wondering if this was dormant, given the kind of lackluster box office of the 2015 film that maybe they just didn't care but clearly someone cares out there yeah there, there's definitely a hardcore fandom out there um it's funny in uh 2014 here in the u.s um there's this nostalgia channel called me tv um and and in the fall of 2014 they had on Sunday nights, they had a, a block of spy shows, which they called the spies who love me. <laughs> me and so they let That's off. That's good. That's good. That's good. They let off with The Man from Uncle at 10 on Sunday night. Uh, they had uh, Mission Impossible at 11. They had Get Smart two episodes at, at midnight. And then they had The Saint at 1 a.m. And they this lasted a year. I was like, that was great. I mean, I... I very much felt like it was a my my childhood, you know, coming back, um, at least for that year. Um, but again, it was just a year, and and I haven't seen uh, the Man from Uncle available on uh, streaming services in recent years. But you know, me. But I have all the DVDs. I have all the DVDs of the Man and the Girl from Uncle. Mm. Uh, the girl from Uncle's a little painful to watch at times, but um, that's really beyond what we're here to talk about. But uh, well, I think we'll uh, we'll discuss distribution in a little bit because I've got a note about that myself. <laughs> but it is interesting because we're doing this review off the back of our interview last week with Mr. Jeff Kleeman, who helped put the Man from Uncle 2015 film together, came up with the story for it. Uh, formerly uh, an exec for United Artists and MGM. And he told us a lot of stories about that film and, and how what the future might be for The Man from Uncle going forward and knowing what the right situation is with that. So I would urge you all to go back to last week if you didn't catch it and check out that interview as well. I think it was a very insightful one. Plus a ton of stories about James Bond in the 1990s you don't want to miss out on. But I think I, I, I kind of want to, I want us and, and Bill, I want you to be part of that. That's why I wanted you on this first one too. It's a sort of try and lead a little mini charge online to get a little bit of love for these spy stories because people you know james bond casts a very big shadow and uh, there are a lot of fun spy movies out there that people don't get the opportunity to take a look at because they're too busy re-watching the same 25 so let's throw a little bit of love at the man from uncle cam i'll throw it to you what are we talking about this week yes we are talking about 1964's to trap a spy which is basically an expanded version of the pilot from the man from uncle yeah, and it's in color. It is in color, yes. Well, and um, I don't want to preempt Cam, no. but like the, pil the pilot itself was filmed in color. Mm -hmm. And it was filmed in November and December of 63. Um, MGM and Norman Felton hoped to sell it to MGM as a color series. So they did film it in color, but then... Uh, NBC, the network, said, uh, can you give us a black and white copy? And like, oh, that was that was kind of a, that was kind of a warning sign. Um, there are actually four versions of this story. So you have the original pilot mm -hmm. filmed in color with the title Solo. Um, then you have the black and white copy of Solo. But attached to the black and white copy, there's this two-minute video with Robert Vaughn talking to the camera. My name is Robert Vaughn, but when that camera rolls, well, Napoleon <laughs> Solo is the name and espionage is the game or something like that. And he basically explains the format of the intended series. So then you had, so then they did extra footage because just in case this doesn't sell we maybe we can do a movie and you know at least in international audiences and get some of our money back so 
that's to trap us by, which is the main topic today. Well, it's interesting. I, I, I always call that phenomenon the, the, the Twin Peaks phenomena because mm. how I first saw Twin Peaks was the European movie, which is the pilot episode, I think, uh, sort of extended a little bit and they have an ending as to who killed Laura Palmer at the end of it and that's how they put it out to Europe to the Europeans basically okay we weren't quite uh, on David Lynch's level we couldn't quite understand where he and, and Mark Frost were coming from so we just got that instead of the series uh, until eventually we did get the series so the, 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 I, I've experienced this before but not in in the shape of uncle I will just jump in because for those who haven't seen the pilot haven't seen any of these iterations here is your synopsis for to trap a spy and this this might be the shortest synopsis i've ever read in my life okay to trap a spy your favorite uncles have a date with danger (laughs) the men from uncle are that's not even right read it anyway i'll read it anyway folks this is from letterbox.com the men from uncle are off to africa to stop an assassination of a president what no no, I mean, I mean, right. there are uh, officials of a newly independent African nation. Yeah, but it all happens in the U.S. Right, and and the letter, the IMDb synopsis. Uh, we're getting into the weeds about synopsis, folks. I'm sorry, but it just says the pilot for the TV series "The Man from Uncle" re-edited and released to theaters as a feature. I think actually the best synopsis is on the poster, and here it is. Join these two amazing undercover agents in the kind of wild way out action that made them famous. I mean, they're all inaccurate because they say these two agents. Oh, yeah. And it's really only focused on Napoleon Solo. We have very little uh, Ilya Kiriakin in this, um, which we'll get into. Which we'll get into the knock list. Um, But um, anyway, I, I, I laid out three versions. The fourth version was the actual first episode of the tv show which Mm -hmm. the title is the man from uncle and they did a last minute shoot where um leo g carroll appears as the head of uncle whereupon it had been will kaluva and all the previous versions um anyway but yeah it's just um i have a uh VHS, a bootleg VHS copy of the um, version with uh, the two-minute Robert Vaughn <laughs> thing at the end. But then that has now surfaced, that two-minute video has surfaced on YouTube. I was going to say, I caught that on YouTube earlier today, and it reminded me a lot of the uh, Dean Martin, Matt Helm trailers he would do for the films, where he's just kind of like, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm I'm Dean Martin, and these are my sleigh girls, and da-da-da-da, and he just sing a little bit. And it, it, it's actually quite right. funky. Right, but, but that Robert Vaughn two-minute video was not intended for public viewing. That was intended oh. for the NBC executives. Mm. See. So that's very much, you know, but, but when once you see it, it's like, well, you can't unsee it. But, yeah, uh, it's there's a nice little wink to it. Yeah, very much so. Well, I, I one thing I'm curious, I think, before we dive a little more into the behind the scenes of this, is sort of setting the table a little bit because Bill, we got your intro story, your your hero origin story with spy movies and spy uh, TV, which is through the Man from Uncle. So that was sort of the first thing you picked up. I hadn't seen any Man from Uncle, uh, you know, to the point where I saw the film. At the 2015 film, and then I watched a bit of the show. But Cam, did you have any other backstory with the man from Uncle? None whatsoever. I'm kind of the same boat as you, except I did see the 2015 movie in theaters. Mm. But it wasn't until we recorded that episode I watched the first episode of the series and really enjoyed it. You can go back to that review, folks, um, from early on in the run of this show. And uh, yeah, we were very enthusiastic about the Vulcan Affair pilot. Um, but since then, I was kind of waiting for something to become available because I just had a really hard time dropping 70 bucks on the, you know, Apple streaming version. You know, Mm -hmm. I kind of am a a slave to social or to physical media where it can't vanish from my hands at any time. So, uh, yeah. Well, if I might, uh, Mm -hmm. Uh (laughs) the actual, the actual catalyst for the man from uncle was not James Bond was Ian Fleming's thrilling cities because norman felton he was born in england 
and emigrated to the U.S., and he became a successful U.S. television producer. He formed Arena Productions, which was based at MGM in Culver City. And so um, Felton was approached, like, can you turn this Ian Fleming book, Thrilling Cities, into a TV show? And they sent him a proof. The book hadn't been published yet. And then it's like, he's looking over, it's like, there's no TV show here. But there's been this meeting set up with executives from NBC and J. Walter Thompson, which had the Ford Motor Company advertising account and other things. So you don't give that up. You know, so he goes, he, he goes to this meeting and he ad libs a pitch. Like, see that guy over there? What if I told you he was a spy? And like, hmm. you know, he does all this. And so like, you know, the, the people he's having breakfast with, like, oh, and then, okay, okay, we get what you're doing. But like, if you could get Ian Fleming involved, you know, like, we'll like, we don't even have, we wouldn't even have to do a pilot. You know, it's like, we'll like, just put this straight on the air. So then a meeting was set up between Felton and Ian Fleming. It was in New York, and it was October 29th through the 31st. That was a busy uh, month uh, because Dr. No had premiered early in the month, and mm -hmm. the Cuban Missile Crisis happened in the middle. Yeah. And um, so they have this meeting. Uh, we only have Felton's versions of, version of uh, events because he did, in 1997, he did an interview for the Archive of American Television. It was about his entire career, but the, the uncle portion, the way he described it was like he and Fleming met in New York and Fleming talked about all sorts of things, basically everything except what they were supposed to talk about, which was a TV show. So uh, Felton borrowed a typewriter at his hotel, typed up a bunch of notes, presented them to Fleming. Supposedly, Fleming said, "Oh, these are good. Like, can I borrow these? Because you know, so, I can't. I, I I can't figure out my next novel." And and Felton, quoting himself, said, "No, no, no, no. These are my ideas." So then Fleming said, "Well, let me look at them, and I'll get back to you later today." And so Fleming took the typewritten notes, and then presented handwritten notes, which were on telegram blanks and for you kids out there there used to be these things paper things called telegrams hmm. and you know you would have a blank you write the message so he you know this sounds like sort of a fleming thing it's, it's kind of a you know it's like whatever it's, it, anyway he wrote <laughs> note he he wrote handwritten notes on 11 telegram blanks in 2015 I had a chance to read um, photocopies of those telegram blanks. And, you know, there were things like uh, Solo keeps a coppery kitchen, meaning he likes to cook. Yeah. Um, which, which ended up appearing in that 2015 Man from Uncle Movie. Intentional or not, you know, like one of Fleming's ideas finally saw the light of day. Um, so, um, one idea was motor racing Nuremberg Well, of course he had done, um, he had written up a notion of, uh, of a bond story, you know, auto racing story. And so, and it didn't work out, but parts of it appeared in the, uh, Anthony Horwitz, uh, 2015 <laughs> continuation novel. Um, and, and there were other things. So there was also a car race actually in the 2015 movie. Uh, the, they don't, yeah. it's not the characters racing, but they are hanging out at a racetrack. Mm. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, one, on one telegram blank, Fleming wrote, he must not be too UN and he must not be sanctimonious, self-righteous. He must be human among all else but slightly superhuman. Anyway, there were various Fleming ideas. And what happened was Felton goes back to California 
he was making a, a TV show called The Eleventh Hour, mm-hmm. and his the producer on that show was Sam Roll, and they had worked together. And so, you know, Fleming, uh, excuse me, Felton wants Felton to work up some ideas because you know, it was very clear like Fleming was never going to do the the heavy lifting. So as it turned out, uh, Rolf had worked had worked up an idea that he couldn't sell called St. George and the Dragon. Right. Which was some kind of spy thing. And and so Rolf kind of reworked, you know, St. George and the Dragon into Uncle. And and he worked up eventually a forty page prospectus for the show. I have a digital copy of it. And um in to trap a spy, which we'll get into, um one of the main segments early on is like Uncle Headquarters is invaded by you know the villains. Yeah. And and this was part of that um that prospectus that Rolf written. That's like one of the earliest um ideas for Uncle and it included um drawings of of Uncle Headquarters and and all sorts of stuff. So pretty much at that point, um, you know, Rolf was taking this over. Well, let me just talk a little bit about Rolf, give some context as to who he was, because like one of the things I noted was that yeah, Ian Fleming was sort of loosely attached to this uncle concept, and Eon was not happy and started hitting them with cease and desist letters yes. because of the character Solo. Oh, wow. And they had a character named Mr. Solo who was going to be featuring in Goldfinger, which at that point was in production, and it was the gangster character. It's a pretty small role. Um, and so that was like kind of making them nervous. And there were other networks that were developing their own spy shows, and they kind of backed off because of the fact that Eon was hitting uh, you know, the uh, uncle project or the Solo project with cease and desist letters. Yes. And so, yeah, like Ian Fleming bailed on his attachments, at, if there were really any concrete attachments to the uncle property, and sold his rights for a dollar, but Felton forged onwards. Sold his rights for one British pound. One yes. British pound, okay. I, I'm being pedantic. Here, no, I, I, yes. I want that correction on the record. Thank on you, On the Bill. record. <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. a, it's a quid, mate. It's not a dollar. But yeah, like Sam Rolfe, who, yes, is basically has the creator credit on uncle, uh, and is the writer of this uh, film we're going to talk about. But this guy was like a TV legend. He yes. started off in the early 50s doing shows like Suspense and wrote the 1953 James Stewart film, The Naked Spur, which is a classic Western. Right. And did a couple movies, but was like a huge TV guy. He created the series Have Gun, Will Travel, which was my dad's co-created. favorite yes. Western show. Yeah, co-created. Yeah. 225 episodes. And that wraps in 1963 and creates Uncle the following year and writes the pilot for that show. I mean, this guy, you go through his filmography, it's absolutely incredible. He actually was the person that developed and wrote the Matt Helm TV adaptation, the one that was not so spy-rific. Tony Franciosa, yeah. The the 70s one. Yeah, in the yeah. mid-70s. Yeah, he did huh. that. Yeah. And Scott, you will appreciate this. He also did a TV show. He wrote the pilot for it called The Manhunter which was set in the 1930s in America. And it's like kind of reworking the paladin thing from Have Gun, Will Travel. The characters are very much different, but it's like, yeah. It's, it's, and he was the producer initially on the, on the Manhunter, but he left the show in the... It only lasted one year, but mm-hmm. yeah. It, it, like, people love Sam Rawls. And in 1992, a year before he died, he made an appearance at this um, um, thing called SpyCon in New Jersey. And that appearance is on YouTube. And like you can tell, like everybody in attendance at that at that convention, they're like you know they, they're practically bowing down to him. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, he, no, he was a magnificent writer and. He also did a. He wrote a script for a proposed Uncle revival in the seventies. It didn't even get to the pilot stage, and then he wrote and produced another spy thing in the seventies that 
you know, was made, was broadcast, but didn't sell. So, so anyway, just more context. I want to jump in because, firstly, can we bring back SpyCon? Because, frankly, mm. it's the only convention we'd ever get invited to. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> Very accurate. And, and Cam, you like, you, you, I think you had like an extra thing to say about Rolf's career that got excited because apparently it connects to me. It does, Scott. So, oh. Sam Rolf, his, two of his final credits uh, before the end of his life Okay. He wrote two Star Trek episodes, Oh, and that's how he went out. He wrote the TNG episode, The Vengeance Factor, and the DS9 episode, Vortex. Uh, both start with V, which is very interesting, as he also wrote The Vulcan Affair. Um, yeah, this guy liked titles with Vs, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. I-, I wish I had the encyclopedic knowledge of episodes that you do, because I- both of those flew over my head completely. I know they are from series that I know. Uh, could you tell me are they late stage TNG and mid like or, or yeah, is it late T- early TNG season two TNG and season one DS nine? Oh no! Oh you no! Know, at at the very end of his life, Rolf was working on a proposed Uncle revival, a kind of next generation thing for um, uh, Ted Turner, and but then he died of a heart attack. He was playing tennis, I guess, and. That was it, and once he died, that project, you know, ceased to be. But uh, the man from Uncle: The Next Generation doesn't have quite the same ring to it as Star Trek: The Next Generation. But uh, no, uh, hey, uh, apparently one of the characters was supposed to be Kiriakin's son. Okay, would they call it the Next Man from Uncle? <laughs> <laughs> that would I, work. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know enough about it, but yeah. You, they, I mean, if they did it now, they'd probably just call it the people from Uncle. Yeah. And yeah. from what I came across too, like after the Fleming stuff and the Eon kind of uh, entanglements there, that was when it kind of led to the development of Ilya being the secondary hero of the series to kind of take the focus off the singular super spy character. Mm. And that also led to the name change, the man from Uncle. And when the NBC people saw the pilot they'd shot, they were very impressed and later decided to, you know, put it out as a TV show. But uh, we should note the director of this TV show and movie we're going to talk about, which was Don Medford, who was another legend of television. And he was born in Detroit, Michigan, and started off with 36 episodes of the 1950s sci-fi anthology series, Tales of Tomorrow, which featured Leslie Nielsen. And he then went on and worked on shows like Alfred Hitchcock Presents, Climax, The Rifleman, The Untouchables, The Twilight Zone, and Dr. Kildare, which led into the pilot for The Man from UNCLE. But this guy worked like decades and did shows like The FBI, Beretta, The Fall Guy, and did a lot of episodes of Dynasty towards the end of his career. So this was like a reliable hand to tackle the pilot for The Man from UNCLE. Oh yeah, he he was he was fantastic. He had a great career. Um, I'll plug something else. I have an FBI episode guy. Oh, nice. <laughs> and 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 um, Don Medford was like one of the most uh, active directors on that show. Mm-hmm. He worked on a lot of Quinn Martin shows, and I, like our audience probably doesn't know who Quinn Martin is, but Quinn Martin was this independent producer most active in the 60s and 70s you know he did the fugitive uh he did streets of san francisco canon the fbi the fbi was his longest running show nine years um yeah and and don medford was very active on pretty much a lot of his shows so as a director and so basically um they had this 70 minute pilot that it was of course edited down to a 50 minute tv version but uh mgm decided to shoot extra footage uh, in metro color and release it as a film overseas that was the initial plan and so that led to obviously hiring luciana paluzzi who was hired coming off of muscle beach party a lot of people think of the thunderball connection but she hadn't shot thunderball yet and so it was grabbing basically a hot star as they were just on the rise this footage she shot was uh done six months before the show premiered on television 
And that footage was also later reused in the 1965 episode, The Four Steps Affair. So we can look forward, at least I can look forward as I make my way through the series, to seeing these scenes again. <laughs> so they reused the Luciano Pellucci scenes in an episode. Yeah. Yes, yes. And, and like, huh. so like I had this exchange um, of emails with a, a Bond author, uh, Robert Sellers. And he was saying, oh, like Luciano Paluzzi, like did this after Thunderball. And I, I, I sent him an email like, no, Robert, she did it before because Rolf uh, wrote up the extra scenes. I think he, uh, oh, he submitted his extra pages in like February of 64. And then like in April of 64, they filmed, you know, it's like four days, uh, whatever. Yeah, it was you know, like very shortly. And like, you know, like for to trap a spy, Lu this is Luciana Paluzzi's dry run for Thunderball. Because yeah. okay, in, in to trap a spy, she um draws an uncle agent to his death. In Thunderball, she <laughs> brings a NATO pilot to his death. Yep. Um you know, it's like, oh she, she has sex with Solo. She has sex with Bond. And then, like, oh, and, like, her underlings accidentally kill her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like... In the same way. I mean, yeah. This, yeah. She's shot in both yeah. cases, yeah. Yeah. So it's... it's You know, the, the funny thing is, um, in my dealings with fellow Bond fans, they don't believe... Let me amend that. Some of them don't believe that Ian Fleming really was had anything to do with the man from Uncle. It's like, oh, that's a myth. Like, no, it's not a myth. Like, no, guys, you know, like, you know, th <laughs> this is this is all available stuff. Like, you just need to do a little research before you start yelling and stuff. Um, ah, it just it, it, it aggravates me, as it, you can tell. I mean, it, uh, uh, we've we've been doing this show for three and a half, heading towards our fourth year, and it it constantly surprises me how many people think that Bond came up with all of the spy tropes. And uh, I just think a lot of the Bond, what Bond has done, has been taking from other things, often doing it better, but taking from other things. So this right. Ian Fleming's yeah. fingerprints being on the early days of Uncle makes complete sense one of the things i thought was interesting was that the villain organization is known as thrush in the tv show uh -huh. but due to the eon issues they changed it to wasp for the movie <laughs> and i'm unclear as to why thrush was such a threat to them but wasp was an interesting choice so supposedly thrush was viewed as being too similar to smirch okay uh, i can see that supposedly I, guess. I like i'm not sure but but i mean like Here's a third one. It was like, um, at one point, they were considering calling the villainous organization Maggot. Yeah. Capital M-A-G-G-O-T. I have a copy of an early draft of The Double Affair, which would become the basis for The Spy With My Face, the second Uncle movie. And in that, they've got Maggot. They still have uh, Allison. As as the head of Uncle, who's the head of Uncle in To Trap a Spy, and you know it's it's just it's like, with Wasp they got out of it because Jerry Anderson was coming out with a show in the fall of '64 called Stingray, and the hero heroic uh, organization was called the World Aquanautic Security Patrol or Wasp. <laughs> And Troy Tempest and his sidekick had caps and they had little wasps on their l logos on their caps. So like, okay, well, we got to get rid of that. Um, so they, you know, they eventually got back to Thrush, but it was like a long, it was like this circular thing. Like, yeah. You, know. you, you just can't get rid of Thrush that easily. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I, I I love these like I I know we're taking it aside. This is behind the scenes. I'm sorry, folks, but just for a second, I do love these like monikers they use for villainous organizations. I was literally watching Carry On spying earlier today, and the baddies are stench. Oh yeah, and I just thought like it's just great. Like I I should make a list of these because there are some really fun ones out there. The Big O in the Matt Helm films is 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 not so great. 
that one's not so great, but it's memorable. And like, yeah, apparently, like Robert Vaughn had to basically dub all the replacement wasp usages. Yes, in this. Oh, you, yeah, film. you can see it. You can see it. But he also did some of the other characters as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, he dubbed them. Yeah, sometimes in some cases, yeah. Oh. Well, also with the Man from Uncle, there were these very popular tie-in novels, original stories, not based on episodes. And so, like, the fourth one was called The Dagger Affair. And the writer was a guy named David McDaniel, who was a fan of the show. He invented, he made Thrush an acronym, which it was, was not in the TV show. Mm. So he made Thrush into the technological hierarchy for the removal of undesirables and the subjugation of humanity. Oh, and golf like, clap. Let's, sorry, golf clap. Yes, take a minute. <laughs> Bow down, Bill Koenig. You just remembered that from a book in the 60s. Well done. <laughs> but but here's the thing. Like, so some uncle fans, long time uncle fans. Oh, that's it. That that's that's what it is. Like, no, it's not. McDaniel made it up. It's not in the show. It is not. Thrush is not an acronym. And I try. <laughs> I try, I beat my head, like, no, stop it, just stop it. But, you know, it's like, oh, it's so cool, We that must be it. <laughs> I'm hey, sorry. It, 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 it's absolutely fine, because you're the man who can say this. You you, you did the website, you you are the uh, the commander. I was going to say the commander of Thrush, but I'm not going to. I'm not going to say that on right. the air. I think well, that don't, well, you can say it on the air, but I don't think I'm going to give you that title. Just you're the commander. You can say what didn't didn't happen with the man from Uncle. But Cam, is there any more behind the scenes? Just in terms of the release of this movie, it's very interesting. Where in 1964, it's released in Hong Kong and Australia, and then like it trickles out to the rest of the world over the next two years. So it's 1965 in May, where it is released in the UK doesn't even hit the U.S. theaters until 1966, right at the start of the year in January, as part of a double feature with The Spy With My Face, which was, I think, the second? Is that the second Man From U.N.C.L.E. film? Yes, yeah. that The Spy With My Face was the second one. And, like, one time I was in L.A., I, it was, this was, like, in the early 90s. I, 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 anyway, I, I stopped at a fast food place. They had a poster for the double feature. Oh, oh, to trap a spy and the spy with my face. Um, yeah, it, 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 yeah. So it was released in the U.S. as part of double feature, and I think that's why uh, I mentioned earlier. I think that's why Robert Sellers got kind of like, well, figured it happened after uh, Thunderball, like, but no, it happened before. Yeah, with the Luciano Paluzzi, I mean, so. I, I get um I get waiting in the states because you folks had it on television. Well, North America, I assume Canada was probably in the same position as as America was. Yeah. But I I don't know how well it's screened over here. I know America was playing stuff like the Avengers by that point because the spy craze had fully gone off by like sixty five, sixty six. Mm. But um yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, listeners, you'd have to let us know if you were watching The Man from Uncle in the sixties in the UK. I, I I don't know how uh, what sort of penetration Thrush had. <laughs> well, with 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 the uh, at least with the two parters that uh, resulted in Uncle movies, mm. NBC agreed to show them only once, and as a result, they got a piece of the action of the theatrical. Right. Um. And and the thing is, there were other TV shows that had the same deal, but not to the extent of Uncle. Um. Mission Impossible had a two-part episode called The Council, and that was edited to a movie internationally called Mission Impossible versus the Mob. And uh, the FBI had a two-parter that was edited into, it was a rather unwieldy title called Cosa Nostra, an arch enemy of the FBI. That's a little... <laughs> <laughs> but but you know you can find the movie posters for that um and again in in all these cases like you, you've got a bigger than usual cast um there's more revenue streams uh because you know there's going to be some kind of theatrical um thing telly saval this is funny telly savalas did two of these things uh, he did an uncle one, and then he did a an FBI one, or 
maybe the other way around doesn't matter but like in early 67 you know telly savalas is doing two of these tv two-part tv shows that end up being international movies it's funny because like this sort of thing sounds like such a craze of the era but it still occasionally happens because you did have for example the star wars clone wars animated show where they packaged like the first three episodes as a theatrical feature um i think they also kind of did an event with the first episode of the very short-lived um what is it um the Marvel show with Anson Mount. Was it The Immortals or something? I'm totally blanking on the name of it. Inhumans. Inhumans, thank you, yes, where they released that as kind of like a standalone movie on IMAX screens. So it's something that does happen, but it's not as, I think, maybe prominent as it was at this point in the 60s. And it is notable that when I looked up box office for this movie, I couldn't find anything. <laughs> and I suspect that may be the case with uh, all of them. Yeah. Uh, but the top three for the year, number one was Mary Poppins, number two was My Fair Lady, and number three was Goldfinger. And I'm talking, of course, about 1964, because obviously this was released over three years, but I'm picking the year it debuted. Right, right. Well, I think um, we've we've painted a picture of this film, and I, I want us to give it a, a, a grand opening of this new franchise. We're going to tackle them all. Let's do it. Let's open Channel D for the first time. <laughs> Bill, you're our guest. Why don't you lead us off? What do you think of To Trap a Spy? Well, it, it's, um, it was a great way for the show to get started. Um, the Man from U.N.C.L.E. is one of the most significant, historically significant things of the spy craze because... Up until then, there had been attempts in the U.S. at doing spy shows. Um, we talked about Lucian Pluzzi. She and David Hedison were in a TV show called Five Fingers. It lasted 16 episodes and was gone. Mm -hmm. And there were other attempts. And an uncle admittedly got off to a slow start. And it was up against uh, the Red Skelton Hour, which... But, but it managed to get through that and and i think it 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 got helped a lot by goldfinger coming out in the uh late in 64 in the u.s it, it came out in september in the uk um it showed that spies on tv could be popular and were popular um it made stars of both robert vaughn and david mccallum you can't tell it so much with to trap a spy because he's because McCallum's not in that mu in it that much. The other thing that makes Uncle different from Bond is the innocent. Mm -hmm. Here we have uh, Patricia Crowley as a quote ordinary housewife unquote that Uncle recruits because she had once dated or dated fairly seriously the villain of the piece. So that was a way for Uncle to kind of get it, you know, a way for it to enter the the scene it's a little notorious actually reminded me a bit of the hitchcock yeah. film it's the more innocent version of that um but, i you know. i wrote yeah. that down too it's got like that sort of taking that person and throwing them into the deep end of a spy world because of a love connection yeah in the yeah. past yeah yeah and, and, and years ago on the spy command i wrote uh, a post about how the differences between fleming's two spy heroes and I said specifically, Solo has more of a moral core than Bond does. Um, mm. I I think, I mean, you guys saw the TV version mm -hmm. of this, and and I think, you know, it, I again, I think Solo definitely has a moral core. He's one of the best scenes for Robert Vaughn was the very last episode, which was a two-parter that resulted in the movie Something with the World. Anyway, but it's like, I was just stunned watching it. Um, he is confronting all these collaborators of the, uh, of the villain, and it's like, he's just, he's so serious. And, he, and throughout the series, he has moments like this, but that episode in particular was great. So Solo has some of the tropes of Bond, but he's different from Bond. And, you know, I, and, and that shows up here, you know, the way he um, 
recruits the innocent mm -hmm. into the mission and you know it's just the other thing about Vaughn real quickly he was an intellectual like during the production of the man from uncle he was studying for a phd mm. he didn't get it until after the show <laughs> went off the air but like i mean the guy was just fantastically brilliant in in 1967 he had, he participated in a televised debate with william f buckley about the vietnam war and i've seen it you know it's it's been uploaded to youtube by the hoover institution which is this very conservative group. And it's like you watch it and, you know, it's like Vaughn, he is like, he's not just, you know, a pretty face, pretty actor there. He, he is like memorized dates and names and stuff and he rattles them off. And like, you know, by the halfway mark, um, you get the sense that Buckley's maybe underestimated Vaughn. Meanwhile, Vaughn's got this kind of like, I've got this... <laughs> body language um i mean he was a remarkable guy david M mccallum was a remarkable guy for different reasons although not not so much in this in this film <laughs> in this not film. in this film no 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 well i i will jump in a little bit about sort of agreeing with what you're saying about robert vaughn because i think one of the best scenes he has in this entire film is the last scene which mm -hmm. i think we remarked about when we covered the the pilot back in the day on that episode where he gives the presents to Patricia Crowley, who goes back to her family, and he just like longingly stares at the family out the window. And it's kind of this evokes this feeling of like, this is something I could never have. I'm always jealous of her getting to go to this comfortable life. That's not something you ever really get the impression in, until No Time to Die, that Bond ever wanted. Well, and also earlier in this film, um, he's talking to Patricia Crowley, and you know they're, they're looking into the mirror, and he said, she's the one you're afraid of you're you know you don't think you can come back from this she mixes with important people she you know and 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 at one point she says you don't mean that but he does mean that and it's like it's a really great scene and that's the thing with uh, spy movies today it's like there's so much action like from beginning to end here's here's like this dramatic moment in between and plus the moment you mentioned from the end it's just it's 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 a wrinkle it's something you don't see much today and i, I think I, I don't want to let you off the hook before i throw to cam to get his thoughts because I, a question i kind of queued up earlier bill was you know we were me and you were talking about doing this episode but us doing the man from uncle movies and you sort of you wanted to do this film but particularly so what is it about you know to trap a spy that really speaks to you you know it this is a great introduction to Napoleon Solo. Um, plus, it's got the whole history with Ian Fleming involved. Um, I really wanted, you know, if, if I had a chance to do any of the eight, I wanted to do the first simply because I wanted to mention um, the Ian Fleming connection because, mm -hmm. as I said earlier, there are Bond fans who don't believe it. And then, like, one of them I showed... Um, I mentioned that uh, uh, prospectus. The title page says Ian Fleming solo. So like one of my Bond friends, oh, I didn't realize this. I thought that was a myth. Well, it's not a myth. Mm -hmm. um, but, but also we really get an idea. This really establishes solo as he's like Bond, but he's different from Bond. And I just think it's a great introduction. And um, this is also... You know, today, like, you have a movie, they almost always have to be origin stories. But no, this isn't an origin story. It's like, you know, he's Uncle's top agent. He's pretty fully you know, formed. He's just, yeah. yeah. Um, but he's, yeah, he's great. Robert Vaughn is great. And it, it's it's a wonderful story. And, and I can see why this <laughs> this resulted in a TV series. Um, you know, there had been tries at it, as I said before, there'd been tries at it before, but you know, it's like, uh, I, again, I just think, I think Vaughn's great. I, I'm curious. What do you think is the more successful version of this story to trap a spy or the TV pilot? I would say the, the, the pilot episode on TV, simply because it's got Leo G. Carroll. Mm. 
Yeah. I think he I think he's better than Will Kaluma. Ask me that question as well, Cam, when we get to the end because <laughs> I've I've got some thoughts on it too having seen them both. But yeah. Uh, and and I think we <laughs> I'm going to throw it to you, actually, Cam. Let, let, let's hear it from you. What do you think? So I really enjoyed the Vulcan affair. And I think, mm -hmm. as Bill was saying, like it creates like the Napoleon character almost like whole cloth, Like where I instantly want to follow this character. He has, in some ways, uh, Red Alert, like the same kind of connection with me as Shatner in the first Star Trek episode, yeah. where you're like, this is someone who has that movie star charisma that just walks on the screen and you instantly want to follow them. And what I like about Napoleon Solo is it would have been so easy to write the TV James Bond mm -hmm. and to just kind of rest on your laurels and go, hey, people like James Bond, let's just give them kind of more of that in a knockoff version. But what I really like is, you know, Bill said like the innocence, but like there's a meticulousness to the character and also like a playfulness. And you have kind of the sexy moments going on with him, but they always feel like they're kind of like not winking at the audience, but that the um, Napoleon character kind of understands that these are kind of fun little moments. And it's communicated really well. There's never that kind of tip over into kind of the carnal aspects that Sean Connery brings as Bond. And so, like, there's a very, like, individual notion to, like, the solo character that I think works really well where I'm instantly curious about his ongoing adventures. I think, though, like, to me, Trappist Spy... Um, where it has issues is, I think the original story is very strong, and I love the connection he has with Pat Crowley in the in the story. When I get to the to trap a spy version, and they're injecting new footage, I find the new footage quite interesting, and I'm sure we're going to delve into it and the scenes and how they play. But it sort of like dilutes the core, the dramatic core of what the initial pilot is about which is about that relationship he has with pat crowley's character mm -hmm. you kind of are you're interrupting it in a way i find somewhat frustrating even if i'm enjoying luciana paluzzi's performance so i think i would like come down on saying that i think i prefer the more edited down version versus this expanded 90 minute take on the story but i enjoy both you know in the very next episode in broadcast order um you have a you have this moment where this military guy is kissing uh, uh, an Iowa farm girl goodnight, and then he goes off on his motorcycle, and then suddenly, like, there's Solo, and he's got his gun, you know, fully assembled gun, and like, you know, halt, and then the guy tries to run him down, and Solo shoots him. It reminds me essentially of a second version of from To Trap a Spy slash The Vulcan Affair of Solo standing behind the bulletproof um, shield. Right. It's, it's, very, it's very similar in the way it's uh, uh, displayed. But throughout, there's no added footage. Um, the Iowa farm girl is, is, you know, the innocent, and she kind of realizes... Uh, she realizes uh, as the story goes on just how serious Solo is, but she also wants to go uh, go out with him on a date. But um, yeah, it, that's that. You know, Cam, that's actually a very good uh, observation. Well, I, I'll just jump in the, at that point as well because what an introduction to a character, though. Mm -hmm. Seeing him behind that glass, and you're like, "Oh, this man is just like impenetrable." You, you, you look at him; he's just, he's just a stud. What is that guy? Who is he? I want to know more. And he walks out, and he has the, he has the bullet dodging skills of Remo Williams. I will add. <laughs> <laughs> that guy's shooting a machine gun at him. He's just slowly walking around the bullets. That's, uh, that's not a criticism. That's more of a, a nod to, to, I don't know pulp tv like that sort of all pulp comic books you know dick tracy yeah. that sort of stuff you could just dodge bullets that way i've not got a problem with it. I, I just found it quite charming in its own sort of 60s way let me throw my hat into the ring if we're answering the question what's better tv show or film i'll get to that but i have to reprise this as a film i can't mm -hmm. come into it and start making comparisons this is a this is a film that came out in my country as a film yeah so for me, watching this, one thing I I felt held it back was what was clearly a TV budget. 
Mm. There was there wasn't a lot of spectacle. I think they did a lot with what they had. You know, the the warehouse scene. I think it's like a it's like a soap factory in reality. That's actually a, right. a nerve right. gas or something they're creating there. I can't remember what it was, but you know, they do a lot with that. But it, it lacks some of the scale that even the contemporaries of that time, not Bond, but people that were spending that amount of money, could get out of it on a big screen. But I'm not going to hold that against it because this is a TV show that's been repurposed for the big screen. That's fine. I actually really enjoyed watching this, though. This was a very, very easy 90 minutes. Robert Vaughn is instantly charming. He oozes charisma, like Cam said. He is a, a fully formed leading man the second you see him behind that bulletproof glass. And so I completely understand why the show was a success. It took a little while to become a success, and obviously it needed to evolve to you know, the men from Uncle as opposed to the man. Um with Ilya, who becomes more prominent as it goes on, I hope, uh, or so I've been told. But, you know, the thing I found that attracted me, I think Cam said the same, was just that sort of Luciana Paluzzi subplot. Now, I love Luciana. I think she's great in Thunderball. I think she's great in this. I think she's great in Muscle Beach Party, frankly. Yeah. But, you know, it's a fun film. And I love watching her with Robert Vaughn. They have great chemistry. But like you could cut every single one of those scenes out and it wouldn't hurt the story because the story was already fully formed at 60 minutes. And no one ever acknowledges her. It's never like, you know, no. Vulcan or anything is saying, oh, yes, I have this, you know, this agent that's going to take them down. It's all completely extraneous stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think one thing that didn't help me with this is watching the episode first. I kind of wish I'd just seen this first. And so I won't be watching the show going along. I'll just be watching the films. And just appraising them as films. Uh, so I, I think that probably hurt me a little bit here. I have nothing wrong with what they did. I just don't think it connects. And so, you know, one thing I think the, the pilot did really well is tell the story of this, you know, dotting housewife who, you know, lives a life that she's very happy with, but she's not excited by. And she's pulled into this world of espionage. And there are consequences to her actions. And her life is in peril. And Napoleon Solo must save her and bring her back to her normal life. And there's this sort of struggle within her. That can she be this person she's pretending to be, schmoozing with all these rich people? And a lot of that's sort of lost on the cutting room floor here because I feel like they've actually cut some stuff out of the pilot. Or maybe that's just something I internalized, but I felt like there was actually stuff missing. It could just be me, though. Well, also, Pat Crowley's character is also forced to choose between Vulcan mm. and uh, Solo. Mm. And she saves Solo's life in the uh, factory sequence because it looks like it looks looks like curtains for solo and then you know she's made her choice and she saves him and um which when innocents were done well with uncle i always liked it the idea that the innocents when they had to make a choice they they did so and they you know they were better than they thought they were mm. And and that's the case with Pat Crowley here, and that's the case with with the uh, the better examples of uh, of innocence. Um, I'll just mention one. Not one of the movies was a thirteen year old Kurt Russell hmm. in an episode, and and it's like, man, I've I've actually thought when after I see that episode, wonder how. You know, Kurt Russell's character is kind of pretty messed up because he he's solo kill people, and and there's this one uh, scene very you know it's like Kurt Russell's characters and Chris Chris now you know this is real and it's very dramatic and very it's very good and but but those are examples of where the innocent is very important to the story and and does well. Like, I know some of my uncle friends don't care for the innocent characters because they feel it detracts from, uh, that's less uh, screen time for Robert Vaughn and David McCallum. But uh, I, I think the innocent is actually what kind of makes this different. And, and To Trap a Spy is an example of that. I, I agree, and I think that's something that's actually, to me, one of the most compelling parts of this is that it's the Pat Crowley character, uh, Elaine, who has the character arc mm -hmm. of the episode yeah. or the film, however you want to look at it. And we get the sense that, like, Uncle are, like, protectors. And they are 
protect her in a very like valiant, pure sense, and that he wants to prevent her from meeting any sort of harm. He needs her to c accomplish the mission, but he's always looking out for her in every way, including the gifts at the end of the trip. Yes. Whereas like a James Bond character doesn't necessarily get too wound up about collateral damage. Yes, he may save the world, but there's not that sense of like, I need to look after these very like, you know, brave, innocent people around me. Like this movie has a very optimistic view of humanity. And I don't know that the Bond universe does as much about the common person who is usually invisible in the films anyway. Right, and 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 that's why I argued that Solo has more of a moral core than than Bond does. Oh yeah, uh, despite despite getting a uh, flack from Bond fans. No, you're completely right. I mean, I don't think uh, Daniel Craig's Bond was heading back to Monica Bellucci's house to console her later on in the film. Well. <laughs> In his way, <laughs> it, well, look, he had he, he he makes the one visit, but I don't think he's making return visits. You know what I mean? Like he's agreed. He 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 doesn't care about aftercare. No, no, he does no, not. Napoleon Solo is very much a a, a cuddler afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> you can read into that however you like, folks. But um, let's talk about things that we liked about To Trap a Spy before we talk about some of the bad stuff. Bill, you're the guest. Uh, give us something you really like, like a scene or a particular performance or anything like that you want to talk about. I mentioned this earlier, but the um, solo standing behind the bulletproof glass, mm -hmm. um, that, is an, I, that is one of the most iconic images of 1960s spy stuff. Daniel Kleinman, who has done um, you know, Bond uh, movie titles, I, I saw this interview where he talked about his various influences, and he cited a lot of things. But he cited that that image, and and um, actually on the show they they ended up starting with the eighth episode. They used that in the main titles. Unfortunately, they stopped after the first season because I thought it was great. But that's one uh, Jerry Gold. We have a Jerry Goldsmith score. It's wonderful. Oh yeah, Jerry Goldsmith scores are always wonderful. But uh, but uh, you 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 got that. Um, the whole sequence of the, I I should say wasp, uh, <laughs> since we're talking about to trap a spy, but wasp slash thrust invaders. Um, that again, that notion was one of the earliest things that Rolf had, and so in that uh, series prospectus it's like a, a short story where he describes what's what's happening so that's you know that's great um and and like you guys cited the end where like he you know solo has actually bought presents for elaine <laughs> it's like his size i guarantee it um you know the sweater he bought for her husband um yeah it, it it's it's i mean there there's a lot to like here we always get the sense that like Solo puts forth effort. He puts forth effort for the people he's trying to help or guide through a mission. But even that scene where him and Patricia Crowley are chained up on the pipes and he's just kicking away at that pipe for you get the sense like a prolonged period of time. And it's not like, hold on, I have a gadget here that's going to save the day. It's like a guy who's just like, I need to get us out of this and I'm going to kick this pipe for the next hour. And you get a point where he's like blacked out and she has to wake up and he gets up and just keeps kicking the pipe. Yeah. That is such a difference to me from not just Bond, Flint, Matt Helm, a lot of the other big spy characters of that era. It's the effort that I really like with Napoleon Solo. And I think that comes across really well here. Well, one quick thing. Um, Norman Felton was in England on, you know, he, he was, uh, he, he made the Dr. Kildare TV series, and he was uh, in England on Doctor Kildare business, and so somebody approached him and said, "What is it about these American TV shows where they're all so tall and giant?" And and, and supposedly Felton said, "I don't know," uh, and and that put the bug in his ear that you know when it came time to do the Man from Uncle, you know it's like the leads weren't giant and tall. Mm. Um, both uh, Vaughn and uh, McCallum were well under six foot. Um, you know, I mean, that's something else. Well, it it, it brings me hope as a, a five foot eight gent 
uh, knowing that I could be an international man of mystery. Because right now, in my head, I'm I'm basically the man in the van. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, just for uh, one of the things I wanted to mention, but I'll pivot from what you said, Bill, is the Jerry Goldsmith score. We haven't really spoken about it, but you know, Jerry come came up with the Uncle theme that does get several iterations over the years from what i've read and i've heard a few of them but i think jerry's sort of militaristic sounding one's probably the best one i've heard of the bunch uh and i mean you 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 generally can't go wrong with jerry goldsmith i don't think i've met a jerry goldsmith score i didn't enjoy so having him on the side here of a brand new spy story is uh it's a recipe for success it's also not trying to clone bond it's not bringing out brassy instruments to kind no. of give the uh, clone version of a Bond theme. It's entirely its own thing, which is very mm-hmm. refreshing as well. Well, and, and, and one of the annoying things about the 2015 movie was Guy Ritchie was determined not to use the Goldsmith theme. Mm-hmm. And, and I did an interview with Daniel Pemberton, the, the composer for the movie, and he confirmed that. I mean, that's, it was just, you know, like, he fig- you know, Pemberton figured he'd put it in at the end, but like, no, Guy Ritchie just didn't want to do it. And but but he but Pemberton knew that fans wanted it in some form. And so the way it appears, it's like about three or four notes when uh Cavill solo is in the truck <laughs> changing channels on the radio. And it's like, you know, it was the Hugo Montenegro version from an album in 1965 Hmm. you know it's like in in retrospect probably shouldn't have done it i mean i appreciate very much that pemberton was wanted to please the fans but like you know it's like if you know if i knew where it was going to be and if i had sneezed at the wrong time i would have missed it and so I, I I don't know why uh, Richie was so determined not to have the Goldsmith theme, but he was, and so that's that. There's no way you can really forgive that choice. I mean, putting I remember the radio scene, you're just sort of flicking around on the dial, and then it comes in for a few seconds, and he dials back out of it again. I think it's a silly choice in my book. But yeah, the, the Jerry Goldsmith score is great. I, I do agree there, Bill, but Cam, do you have a like you want to bring up? Yeah, um, I thought that, like, the supporting cast is pretty strong. Like Patricia Crowley is just like an look. Napoleon Solo is the MVP, but she's a close second, and I think takes us on an entire dramatic story of someone who like has this lure of like a fantasy life, like an excitement of a life not lived, and then realizes that she's happy with her more domestic lifestyle. Like I think she pulls that off beautifully. But a performance that I really like is William Marshall as the premier of this African nation. Yes, mm-hmm. because he creates a character that I think has such like an honorable quality that you are drawn to. He's magnetic when he first shows up in this story that you're like, I don't want this guy to get assassinated because that's the big fear is that's the character who's going to be targeted. And they really make you care about him. And so when you have the heel turn, not only does the betrayal sting a little bit more, he becomes a really compelling villain as well. And he's someone who has played that kind of duality in Star Trek, actually, in the episode The Ultimate Computer, uh, where he also has kind of a uh, a turn at a certain point in the episode. Mm-hmm. He's great there. He's great here. And he's someone who I've seen him in a few things, but I feel like I need to check out more of his work because I'm consistently impressed with him. Um, you know, he actually, he actually shows up in the fourth season of the show. Again, it's not one of the movies. And it's like, you know, it's like, He's a scientist, and it turns out he's a traitor. And it's a, it's a similar dynamic to the to the uh, thing. Um, I was re-watching uh, To Trap a Spy before this recording, and there's that one scene where he talks about his, um, his you know, the other two officials from the country, from Western Natumba, you know, something about martyrdom, I will mm. rule in their name. And he, the way he says it, he's so serious. It's like, he he was a great actor. And I've seen him in other things. He's he's just he's just wonderful. And also Fritz Weaver as, as Vulcan. He's just, you know, he's he's a nasty guy. Um, but but Fritz Weaver was, was again a great character actor in all sorts of things. He's not quite uh, Claude Rains. No. But uh, few people are. 
but he's better than Doug Ray Scott. He is better than Doug Ray Scott. Yes, that is true. And and many people are. <laughs> That's uh, fair. I, I I was gonna mention Luciana Paluzzi. I think she gives a great performance of what she's given. Very little screen time. She plays that sort of sex pot devious villainess thing. I mean she's got that down. Yeah. She knows that. It's the dry run for Thunderball. <laughs> Yeah, mm-hmm. I, and and you know if you want more of her in Thunderball, go and watch this film because for the twenty minutes or so she's in it, she is magnetic. And speaking yeah. of magnetic, again, I want to mention Robert Vaughn. I can't wait to tackle more of these films because I think he's just fantastic in this. And we've spoken about both of those things, so I'll leave those to one side. Maybe if, like, if we come back to them, we do. But we've given those things both love. The thing that surprised me a bit about this and. I don't really remember it when I watched the original pilot is just how progressive this show, this film is compared to its contemporaries at the time. You know, a couple of years time, you've got the woman from uncle, you you know, they're side by side. People debate whether there was a female double O in that scene of Thunderball or not. Yeah. I, I, there was, she's there, but, if you want to debate that, that's fine. But there are equal footing both of those agents. But like, you know, it it's it's not played as if Patricia Crowley's character is anything less than the Polian solo. She's doing a very noble thing for Uncle and her country. And I think like the, the gender politics are very progressive for the time. It's just quite a refreshing thing. Like even you know, I said Napoleon Solo is more of a cuddler afterwards than sort of a dine and dash sort of guy. And you do get that feeling. He is more respectful to women around him. And I, I mean, I'm not someone who throws, you know, I, I, I don't uh, I don't berate Bond for his choices at the time. I think it was very much in the text of Fleming and sort of of that time, what they were performing in. And all of those Bond films are pieces of their time. But just for 1964, this is quite refreshing. Well, I like the moment he has at the end with like the flight attendant yeah. who comes over and is like, can I do anything for you? And he looks at her and kind of like smiles. And the two of them just like kind of laugh. Yeah. It's not like a, you know, like Bond would be locking eyes with her and have like the animalistic look, you know, like I like that for Napoleon Solo, it's always kind of like a winking game. And he has it also with like the uncle version of Monty Penny here. Yeah. Who's like, you know, setting up the tanning salon in the office. Which... And drinking milk and just like... <laughs> What a weird life she's living over on on Channel D. Yeah, and he's like walking around like spinning her a bikini top like around his finger, and it's just like it's all played as kind of this winking sense of fun. It's mm. it has like no kind of like weight of like lasciviousness or anything like that. It just feels like people that are kind of enjoying each other's company and playing around. You you look at like Bond in at the beginning of Thunderball, and he's like strong arming <laughs> the uh, attendant at Shrublands into the sauna with him. Sure. For fear of her losing her job, which is questionable at the best of times. But like the flight attendant at the end here is just like kinda of gives her the old uh Marl Hyde nod and she kinda of giggles back and that's all you need to know and it's still very like consenting and I know this is boring some people to hear, but I, I, I like going into these films and not having to experience any sort of uh, level of ick particularly. So uh, this was refreshing. Well, I mean ultimately my takeaway is I would rather be friends, I think, with Napoleon Solo than James Bond. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah. I want to be on the uncle team, uh, not so much yeah. Uh, MI6. Yeah, and Ilya, uh, stay tuned. I'll let, I'll get back to you when I see him in, actually factor into a story. <laughs> we interrupt this program to bring you a special report. Red alert, spy hards. We are shaking things up over on the Patreon page. That's right. We are launching an exclusive new show where we tackle the exploits of the small screen's greatest secret agents like Jack Bauer, George Smiley, and beyond. And don't forget, every month you also get two Agents in the Field episodes where we decode the adventures of your favorite spy actors in their biggest non-spy movies. But Cam, tell the people what we have coming up next. Catch up with our February offerings over on Patreon. I'm talking about reviews of Vertigo, The Towering Inferno, and the David Hasselhoff Nick Fury TV movie. What more could you even want in your life? So strap on your Condor Man wings and soar into the future with us over at patreon.com slash spyhearts. 
But before Big O zaps us with a red pulsating laser, let's get back to the spy jinx. Okay, folks, dislike time to trap a spy. Bill, do you have something you dislike about this film you'd like to discuss? Oh, there's a couple continuity gaffes. Um, we see, um, I forget if it's Lancer or Dancer, because in the TV version, it's one name, and to trap a spy, it's another. But that, you know, the Uncle Agent gets killed. Um, you know, there's all these uh, machine gun things. And so then later, when uh, Solo is... Uh, <laughs> Solo avoids getting killed by uh, Luciana Paluzzi. You see all these bullet holes in the in the uh, walls. Like guys, couldn't you like clean that up? But that's 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 a very minor. Wait, did they leave the bullet detail. holes in the wall when Robert Vaughn's character turned up? Um, it appears so. Oh, but then in other shots, it appears not. <laughs> oh, she man. needs a better gimmick. She needs a much better gimmick for assassination. <laughs> that whole shove them in front of a light thing. That's uh, yeah, yeah. that's so 1930s. <laughs> but, uh, what problems I have are very minor. It's just, you know, it's like, it's easy to uh, get past that, put it that way, with all the, the strong aspects. Well, you, you mentioned continuity, and one thing I suppose I'll, I'll chuck in with that is the ADR of it all. There is, I mean, you mentioned Robert Vaughn doing other people's lines, which I hadn't picked up on, but, and and I understand now the Wasp Stingray thing, because I was a Stingray fan as a kid, so I get that. And obviously pivoting back to Thrush, uh, it, it does. It is quite noticeable when they do put the ADR in there. I have to say they're not hiding it very well. And I don't think they have the ability to do so. It reminded me sometimes of that uh, Simpsons episode where Bart goes to camp and they're watching the video, and <laughs> you keep hearing the Mister Black <laughs> over top of uh, characters' names. Yes, <laughs> it was reminding me of that at certain points, and I was cracking up. That's the thing is like. It's it's sometimes tough to like review a movie like this because it is a TV show that's blown out with extra footage that's ultimately extraneous to its story. Mm -hmm. There's these little technical fixes like the you know wasp stuff, and so it's like okay, like you have to gauge it in its own terms. But like, how do you stand it next to some of the other more um, you know movies made for the big screen, right? Like mm -hmm. movies that were formed and conceived as big screen experiences. And it is those kind of technical moments that kind of pull you out of it. Or even like I sat there with the Luciana Paluzzi trying to figure out the exit points. Yeah, yeah. To get back to the actual story, right? To be like, okay, where's the cut that we make now to get us back to where we were? And like those were very visible as well to me. Yeah, you can absolutely see the seams where they've just cut stuff in. I can't remember how they actually catch him in the pilot episode where he loses his car and ends up in the drink and gets all bloody i can answer this one uh so there's the kind of like the balding guy who's working at the factory yeah napoleon walks out of the party gets he's going to his car and that guy that goon is it basically says that he's wired the car so it's a different guy saying he's wired the car to set off the, the sleeping gas mm. and so he gets in his car and is gassed almost immediately so you don't have the whole trip to the house where uh, Luciana Paluzzi's character is. All that stuff is obviously added. So it was really just him walking out of the party, getting in his car, and being gassed. Okay. Um, Cap, uh, did you bring, was that your dislike? Well, I mean, I'll say just on top of that, um, there... <sighs> there is just the sense of like, okay, we're watching a Man From U.N.C.L.E. pilot where your secondary lead is is almost distracting in how little he's contributing, <laughs> where the David McCallum character isn't present. So it does make me question, like, how strong is this as a Man From U.N.C.L.E. film where your secondary lead is basically a exposition bot who shows up a couple times and disappears? Like, is it tough to then rank it when you're determining, like, what is the best of the Man From U.N.C.L.E. films when a key crucial component of the success of that series is absent largely? Well, you know, it's funny. On the trailer for To Trap a Spy, the two shots of David McCallum are actually from are, are actually from the third Uncle movie. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Also starring David McCallum, and it's like you know this him holding a gun, and it's not even from this movie. Yeah. But um, there's the scene where they're looking at the yearbook. 
Um, was that shot afterwards to add to the movie? Because I recall in the actual pilot, they're just watching basically uh, Robert Vaughn is sat down in his office, I think, with the boss, and they're watching like a, a computer monitor show photos. In in the TV version, actually, Ilya brings Solo the yearbook, and he says, Mr. Waverly thought this might be of use. It's as if um, Waverly got the idea, and then, and then had, had, had Ilya play Aaron Boy, whereupon in To Trap a Spy, um, Solo asks Ilya to bring the yearbook because he's got an idea, but he needs to see the yearbook first before he knows who to um, approach. Um, it's a minor thing, mm-hmm. but th- it is interesting in that there are cases where um, the Uncle movies and the Uncle TV episodes are at variance, and the most severe case is a Australian agent um, who gets killed in um, uh, The Spy With My Face, but he survives in The Four Steps Affair. Mm. <laughs> I, was, I was watching uh, The Four... I watched The Four Steps Affair as well before today's recording. Um, yeah, so, so there, there are continuity issues <laughs> between the movies and the TV show at times. Right. I think before we wrap it up and start looking at Anocos, I'm just going to chuck in my, my two little dislikes, they're tiny little things. Firstly, and this may be a positive to some people, but I found it odd that there was no real setup as to what the organization is or who Napoleon Solo particularly is. You get a tiny bit of exposition from certain characters, and I don't know whether I would needed a whole other five-minute scene explaining the mission of Uncle, but I, I think for people who are going in completely blind and have no idea what this franchise is or who Napoleon Solo is, there maybe was an opportunity there to sort of set the table a little bit. Mm, right, and to maybe explain it specifically what Uncle is, yeah. And and also uh, Wasp in this case. Um, yeah, sure, Wasp. <laughs> wasp. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the other thing, which is a, a very minor dislike, although quite major in stature, and you'll know what I mean in a second, you don't cast Richard Keel in your film and don't play up his height. I do not understand <laughs> that. Because you look at some of the things he's doing in the 60s, and they are playing up to his height every time. And he's just in it for a second, folks. Yes, that's right. Jaws is in this film. Another Bond connection to the Trap of Spy. He uh, tries to take out uh, Napoleon Solo and fails miserably. But Bill, I can, I can hear you wanting to say something about uh, Richard Keel. Well, actually, I, actually about another guy. A guy who's been in two other movies you've reviewed. Mm. And that is Roy Jensen, who uh, was in Our Man Flint. He was that military guard that that uh, James Coburn attacks. And he was in The Ambushers in that fight in the brewery. Okay. And he was, he was all over the spy craze. And, you know, like, he was uh, originally a, a player a player in the Canadian Football League and then he became an actor and he's you know so like yeah so this is you know at least the third time he's been in a movie reviewed by the Spy Hearts broadcast but you're right yeah I remember watching uh watching this when I rediscovered the show in the 80s like Richard Keel like well and then like he's gone like that he actually shows up again in a first later first season episode he actually gets some lines and actually gets some billing in the uh, end titles, but uh, there they did play up his his height. Um, okay, I was just looking up uh, Roy Jensen. He is quite the prolific actor in the in the sixties of the sort of spy craze too. He's in I Spy, uh, Mission Impossible. He turns up in. I'm seeing if there's anything else I'm missing? Obviously, my uncle we've discussed. There's probably a few more in there, but yeah, okay. This guy. Oh, and the Wild Wild West. This guy gets around. Hmm. And and he shows up again in The Man from Uncle and in one of the Uncle movies, The Helicopter Spies. And Get Smart. And Get well, Smart. he did it all. Yeah. He's, uh, he's got all the badges. And he was in Batman 66. So, yeah, perfect. Yeah. 
Um, but yeah, that was that was my tiny slash huge, depending on how you de- how you uh, deem that one uh, problem with the film. But it was nice to see Richard Kill nonetheless. Always nice, always nice. He's held your head before, hasn't he, Cam? He has actually, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you haven't washed since. That's right. Yeah, that I treasure that photo greatly. Well, before we get to the knock list, folks, any final notes? I'll throw it out to the team. Bill, anything else you want to add about the Trapper Spy before we get to the knock list? No, let's go to the knock list. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> uh, let me just see if I have anything to add. Then, otherwise, I'll take us over. I'll just say I enjoyed the laughing fit that Solo and um elaine had after they got free and she's kind of upset and you know the fact that like she looks like a mess after everything and he gives her like the earring and the two of them just have this like laughing fit together i'm like what a human moment and so not something you would see in so many of the other spy franchises yeah for sure and uh my uh my little note was obviously we mentioned the shooting of the bulletproof glass now is it my imagination or did the same thing happen in the man with the golden gun well, he shoots the wax figure. Scaramanga shooting at a mirror of... Does he shoot at the mirror that has Roger Moore in it and, like, ends up the glass sort of breaks a bit? No, uh, um, Roger Moore shoots... Well, b- well, first, uh, Rodney, I think, was the gangster's character, shoots at a reflection of uh, Scaramanga, and then Bond does the same thing later. Ah, I see. I'm I'm adding two things together in my head. And the last thing I said I'd mention it earlier on in the show is distribution is very weird for this. Despite these films having come out in the UK on the big screen, the only way to get them right now is through DVD. A couple of them are on YouTube and on the Internet Archive, so we will have links in the show notes below. This one is on the Internet Archive currently, so you can get a hold of a copy if you haven't seen it before. But uh, it's just weird, I find, that you, you really can't get it on any sort of streaming, even if you buying it on streaming it just isn't available here in the uk very strange because yeah it's available here and i bought the um warner brothers archive collection when there was a um black friday sale online right yeah okay well uh bill you want to come to the knock list here we are to trap a spy is it making the list of the best spy movies of all time this is the uncle's first of eight first of nine uh, attempts at getting on here so let's see how they do uh, you get the first vote, Bill. What do you say? Uh, I say it should be on the knock list. It, um, the Man from Uncle is historically important, but that doesn't mean much if the story isn't good. This is a great story. Um, Robert Vaughn is 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 doing fine. Uh, Patricia Crowley, Fritz Weaver, great cast. Um, you know the main weakness is like well, there's not as much. Uh, David McCallum, but that will be remedied in future installments. But uh, I, I think it, I, I think it should be on the knock list. Quick question, yeah. Um, okay. Is this your favorite of the Man from Uncle films? No. Um, my favorite. The thing is, what's the best and what's your favorite can be two different things. Sure. My personal favorite is the third one. Uh, one's by too many. Um. And I, I, for me, it's very much nostalgia because um, the two-part episode that was turned into One Spy Too Many led off the second season. And by that point, Uncle was really big and being two parts with a cliffhanger in the middle. Um, I, I, there are There are some problems with, some of the some of the shots but rip torn is a great villain Mm. so that's my favorite of the of the movies but um i do think without this uh the man from uncle doesn't happen so that's another factor why i say it should be on the knock list Mm. okay okay i think we may have a bit of an interesting discussion ahead of us but uh that's one yes so it's all very much to play for cam what do you think? This is really difficult because yeah. in its current form, because we are talking about To Trap a Spy, the film. We are not talking about Solo. We're not talking about The Vulcan Affair. Mm-hmm. And the problem is, to me, like The Vulcan Affair is a fantastic pilot that I think is just refined down to somewhat perfection. 
Whereas when I look at like to trap a spy, it's kind of like it's distracting from its strengths sometimes with this added footage. Mm -hmm. And it has these kind of, um, as we said, kind of awkward, you know, editing points and things like that. But it is also an entirely successful launch of the Napoleon solo character that I think is genuinely magnetic and interesting to watch. So I'm really struggling, Scott, <laughs> like really struggling because like, I think like I always like to take historical importance into consideration as well yeah you know like i don't think our man flint is one of the all-time great films but we did put it on the knock list because we both felt it was a very important example of the 60s spy craze mm. and did that kind of tongue-in-cheek homage to bond really well and better than most frankly especially after some of the other ones we've watched since you know um some of the matt helms and uh the uh what was the rod taylor one we watched the one whose name the liquidator yeah, things like that. Yeah. yeah, or the Dr. Goldfoot. I still feel good now, especially maybe even better, about putting Our Man Flint on in consideration of some of those. Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm kind of struggling because I, I could see myself tipping over for a yes for this because of what it did for the spy canon and as an entry point for people who want to discover this world. It's just the fact that like it has technical kind of issues going on with the form it exists in this story plus the fact that as i mentioned earlier the secondary lead of the story is largely absent and doesn't contribute to what ultimately the journey is going to be this is uh i mean maybe we'll just discuss it because this is exactly the same position that i'm in because i could understand this being very important to the spy canon uh you know as bill you quite rightly said this this is the reason why the man from uncle exists this episode this film but I can't help but being held back by the idea that Ilya isn't here. And I, I wonder, like, is the next one just as good but also has Ilya in it? So shouldn't I wait for that? But then I shouldn't be thinking about future films when I'm picking a yes or no for this. Yeah. Um, yeah. But luckily, I asked you before I asked myself, Cam. So uh, back to you. So I, I guess I have to, like, then sit here and go, okay. In comparison to Our Man Flint, which do I enjoy more? Because mm -hmm. I've now seen this twice. I actually think I enjoy this a hair more. I think the Napoleon Solo character is much more magnetic to me and someone who pulls me through this story better than the Derek Flint character does. Sure. So I think like when I kind of take into consideration the ian fleming connections to this which i do think are somewhat interesting and important mm -hmm. but also just the fact that this does launch an entire universe and robert vaughn is like movie star wattage in this and so much fun i think i'm going to give this a yes because i actually think this would be something that could pull people in and interest them in future films and maybe i'll regret this when i watch the second or third one and i'm like oh my god these are home run masterpieces in comparison to to trap a spy who knows but i can't i can't play fortune teller right now i have to go with this moment and i am a little nervous scott of having a wrecking crew situation <laughs> Where we pass by the silencers and murderers row and then are like, well, I guess the wrecking crew is going on the knock list. <laughs> well, that was my decision, to be fair. Uh, mine and John Cork's decision to do that. So we'll ever Bless you we'll both. forever. <laughs> yeah, we'll forever have that. I listened to that episode, by the way. Did you, where do you come down on the wrecking crew there, Bill? Should it have made the list or not? I would rather the silencers make it than the wrecking crew. But. So had we looking back on it, but uh, <laughs> it's all we had. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean John. Uh, John was very uh, vigilant and very forceful, and 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 to be honest, I was debating. Oh, do I t do the uh, John Cork uh, play? But uh, I decided no. I would be a little more. I love the term the John Cork play because he may have been the most passionate guest argument for a movie to make the knock list I've ever heard and all time spy hearts moment loved it well okay so we've just got two yeses folks so I can tell you that to trap a spy makes the knock list but I will just throw in my vote if Cam had maybe said uh, no mm. and my vote would have been no right the reason being the things I spelled out earlier. I think the Luciano Paluzzi scenes, much as they are great, detract from the whole. I think that 
it's this ep- this film is missing a core character of this di- of this dynamic duo that we're supposed to be having and i haven't had him yet so i i i'm almost holding out hope that the next couple of films are just a smidge better because you get them together uh that's where it is for me do i do i think this is need to see i i think it's a it's a hairs away like it's a few notches away from knock list for me and maybe by holding out i'm uh you know i'm missing the point maybe I, i'm holding out hope for something that isn't there in the future but I, it's already had its uh ticket punched to trap a spy is making the knock list two yeses out of three uh, the dossier on the film is complete and filed as classified. It's a bit of a while, actually, since we've had a knockless inductee that me and you haven't agreed on, Cam. Yeah, no, that's true. And one thing I had to take in consideration as well, which I didn't mention, is like when I watched the original story of this, mm-hmm. that convinced me to watch this show. Sure. Like that compelled me to ultimately drop $90 to buy the box set. Mm-hmm. And that's not something that's very common with me. And so clearly, like, that impacted me in a way, like, where when I watched um, Our Man Flint, I wasn't like, I need to watch In Like Flint tomorrow. It was like, okay, that was enjoyable. I can move on. And that's the case with some of the other, I think, crucial movies that are on the knock list that maybe started a trend or were key historical moments along the spy genre. Mm -hmm. They didn't necessarily, they weren't, you know, basically, like, catapulting me into the next adventure, whereas this one did. So, yeah. Sure. No, I, I think you've justified your reasons perfectly well. And I think you and Bill have ushered the man from Uncle finally onto the knock list. Guy Ritchie didn't score it, but, uh, you know, Napoleon Solo is finally on the knock list. Many people can rejoice now. That's true. Yeah, very true. And, and speaking of Bill, Bill, thank you for coming back to Spy Heart. It's been a pleasure having you back on the show, sir. Well, thanks for uh, inviting me. And uh, sorry if I... Uh got a little uh, intense when I lobbied to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I think, well, you, you voted yes to go on the knock list. You knew what you were doing. You uh, you wanted to get your stamp on the knock list approved Man From U.N.C.L.E. film because the rest of them might miss it. That's right, because I was 0 for 2 on the knock list on my two previous appearances. Mm, that's right. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, there you go. You are, uh, Bill Koenig is officially on the knock list. There you go. It doesn't get much better than that. And um, if people want to hear a bit more from you, I sort of mentioned the websites earlier, but you know, where can people find you online, Bill? Uh, the Spy Command is at hmssweblog.wordpress.com. The Man from Uncle Episode Guide is at uncleepisodeguide.wordpress.com. Um, I have other sites. You can see them down the left side of the, of the page. So um, anyway. Well, we'll have links in the show notes below to all of those. But also, you know, Bill, you you have a Spy Command podcast you put out from time to time, and also you're very pop, you know, very busy and popular on social media. Um, usually, it's at at the Spy Command, I believe, on Twitter at least. Right. That that that's right. And uh, I'm on Facebook. Um, there's a Spy Command page on Facebook, and you know, you you, you can find me all over the place. You're just like us. You're a terrible spy. You can be found everywhere. That's right. That's right. (laughs) Well, Bill, it's been a pleasure once again, sir, and we hope to have you back on the show soon. Thank you. Well, there you go, folks. That was our chat about the very first Man from Uncle Film to Trap, a spy. I want to thank our guest, Bill Koenig, the spy command himself, once again for joining us on the show. And uh, it was a very successful first entry for the man from uncle it made the knock list it did indeed yeah but uh from knock list status onto our next mission cam what have we got coming up next week yeah we're lightening things up even more so yes it's a lot of fun hanging out with napoleon solo but next week we're getting downright wacky we're gonna look at the 1985 chevy chase and dan Aykroyd comedy vehicle spies like us a, a film that I really do feel like uh, portrays us on the big screen. Mm, right. I thought Ishtar did. Well, Ishtar is about two idiots that are at least somewhat musically talented. Okay. That's true. We have no talents. Sure. Yeah, that's fair. Mm. And uh, joining us as well later in the week, we sit down with Mr. Dave Thomas, uh, a man with many credits to his name. 
But most importantly for Spies Like Us, he was part of the team to help write the film. Yeah, that's a big interview and one I think people are really going to enjoy. And he's got a few other spy connections to look out for as well, but I'll leave that to Dave to tell us all about next week. So, folks, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to join us next week as we take a look at 1985's Spies Like Us. And uh, if you want to help support Spy Hards, your uh, friendly neighborhood spy movie podcast, then do consider joining us over on our Patreon patreon.com slash spyhards lots of different options for supporting the show and over 50 bonus episodes to tuck into and now we've started tackling spy tv shows over on the patreon we're currently working on an episode it may even be out by this point on the bbc adaptation of john Carre story the night manager so that's uh, one to uh, check out folks and if you don't already make sure you follow us on social media at spyhards that's s-p-y-h-a-r-d-s on facebook twitter and instagram but until next week folks cam and i are off to the clinic to deal with a nasty case of thrush mm-hmm.